Hi. Hello, Rabbi. Hi. So yesterday, um, you had that question about the mother of Sisra. Why? We, or I don't know if, if, yeah. if why uh, you were bothered by why he didn't list it, but I was asking it. Why, why he didn't list the mother of Sisra. So I was thinking about it afterwards that the mother of Sisra at first blush is not being brought out to explain the reason for the chauffeur blowing. She's been brought in to talk about the nature of the sounds or how many there are, but it's not like he was giving a list of the reasons for the chauffeur blowing. What are you supposed to be thinking about when the chauffeur is blowing. So I don't know if they would say that you're supposed to be thinking of the mother of Sisra. I was the one who was extending it to the notion of the mercy of mothers, of the Rahmanas, the, the Rahamim of mothers, um, and making it broader that the mother of Sisra is part of a kind of pattern um, of uh, evoking mothers who are concerned for their children but the so so you could say that one of the things we're thinking about is is, is evoking god's mercy like the mercy of a mother for a child but but that's not necessarily when they bring up the mother of sisra they're mostly bringing her up as a model for the sound what you what what, is, what you were looking for the sound. So you could say that's why Sajikon doesn't bring it, because it's not right, right. But not specifically. Yeah. But uh, I while I was looking it up, I did find this um this is uh, somebody had a, a on Safari uh, when you search now for something, you get amongst the things you get offered are source sheets that people are putting together on Safari. So this person had a source a source sheet where they had Rosadi Gaon's reasons, and then they added something from the Lubavitcher Rebbe. It says here Slichos 1962. I don't know if they're paraphrasing from it. I don't know. It doesn't. It's still hard to tell. But anyways, it says blowing the shofar is the unique and special mitzvah, which is an integral obligation of Rosh Hashanah. The mitzvah of shofar is not a gathering of multiple musical instruments, but rather it is by necessity one instrument. Furthermore, it is not a complex instrument that is capable of playing exceptional compositions. The shofar perforce a simple animal horn, and as our sages say in Rosh Hashanah 27b, all sounds are kosher for the shofar. The shofar emphasizes, in other words, the quality of sounds. The chauffeur emphasizes that our presence of mind must be first and foremost focused on the individual. Our emphasis must be on infusing holiness even into the common parts of our daily lives. Then the focus shifts to how the individual is part of the community. I'm not sure, I feel like I would want more context for that quote, right. but there that's sort of um a kind of subtle and uh, sophisticated i'm going to call it sophisticated um uh, kind of uh, meditation that he's, he's, he seems to be suggesting uh maybe something like uh that quote from rav avram yeshua heschel i think it was the Abderov, who said that when he was young he wanted to change the world. So he spent years trying to change the world. And then he realized that he'd probably be better off if he just changed Himself. his country. And he worked yeah. the next few years on his country. And then finally, you know, step by step, got to the point that he would be best off if he just worked on himself. Um, so um, it sounds something like that, that the, that uh, you, when you're, I guess, focused on uh, work or service or change, that you first focus on the individual and then you work on how to bring that into, um, into the community. So I guess that notion of one, whole, one simple horn 
uh, one a sound from one simple horn, then um, working on that to become part of the community. Yeah, another view of sound, the sound, or, I yes. guess, the being experience. unified. All right, yeah. The, thing. the interesting thing to me, <clears throat> and then I have a question. The interesting yeah. thing is that we take Sisera. I mean, we could have taken Rachel, Rachel, right? And saying, crying, the cries of, that we would take an enemy and it's kind of broadens out the chesed of Hashem, you know, even. Right, yes, that she's an unlikely, right, an right. unlikely candidate. There, there's something about that description when you read it from Devorah, it's like Devorah has ice in her veins. <laughs> like she brings up that image and she just could care less. Like she she has, um, you know, evoking what would be the most tender uh, situation. And then he's dead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, yeah. 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 The fact so, that we recognize yeah. that she's still a mother. Right. Right. That old idea. Um, someone asked me last night on Shabbos when we don't blow the shofar, do we still say the shofar rope for the ten? You do. In oh, in you do. You do. You do, okay. you do say it. All right. Uh, right. There's a whole mimer from the Rebbe Rashab on that. Um, there might be a whole safer, not just a mimer. Or, or it's just an enormous mimer, or it might be a whole safer. That is, is his uh, all about Shabbos, not blowing the chauffeur on Shabbos. Really, the significance really. Significance of it. Who like are we it, studying with? Oh, I'm sorry, you. Not <laughs> we got the I same know. answer. Okay, yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, website. May I just say one thing? Yeah, David, go ahead. Yes. One, I, I forgot what my source. I think it was pulled from barrel wine, but I'm not sure, and I'm not sure what the source was. The only thing I'm sure of is that the association between Sisera's mother and the blowing of the chauffeur, because she sent out these wailing sounds, which are, of course, the sounds of the chauffeur, but it was supposed to represent, she represented a person who had never experienced defeat in her life. Everything had been roses in her entire life, you know, and, and all of a sudden, this was the first and final, the, the bit, it wasn't the Rachmanis, it was the complete defeat? Yeah, com com complete oh. anguish, complete all right, complete loss. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, I like that. That's cool. Because that, yeah, that there is a uh, I've had this conversation with, uh, I don't remember why I was talking with Shmuel about this, but you have that guy who wrote um, the book Black Swan, Talib, what was his name? Uh, Talib. You know Talib. Yeah, so he was featured by Malcolm Gladwell in one of his books. And uh, Apparently, he had a fund that uh, would benefit. It was designed to benefit in a black swan kind of moment. And this fund was set up before 08, you know. And so it, he was talking about how um, for a few years, when there's the heady time where it's sort of like anybody is making money, um, but violating all the basic rules of investment. And um, um, so there's like a period of time where you're reminding people buy low, sell high and et cetera, and the dangers of leveraging yourself too much. And, uh, but nobody's being punished for mistakes. I mean, everybody's getting rewarded. And then suddenly that's the thing about these black swans is that when they happen, they happen to devastating effect. And it's not like the person who didn't follow the rules is just, um, you know, stung and, you know, has to regroup after a minute. There, there's nothing left. When they, when they finally 
when it, when it finally happens, they're completely wiped out uh, in many of these cases. So um, I, I was giving the example of, uh, for some reason, he didn't like this example. I don't know why, but I was giving an example. I was trying to illustrate this by saying, let's say you have a guy who is insisting that housing should be built to withstand a category five hurricane. Uh, or some kind of level of hurricane that Florida never experienced. Or, and, but he's saying that one of these is gonna come and, if, and everybody should build their house to be able to withstand this kind of hurricane. So you have, let's say, tens of thousands of houses built um, a, along the shore, uh, but, they're, not, but they're, they're only built to, let's say, withstand a level four hurricane. And you have this one guy who built his house to be able to withstand this level five or level some, if there could be something higher than that. So when it actually finally happens, there's only one house standing. The, the, the other houses are not standing anymore. They're just like, they're, that's what you see. It's not like you see a bunch of partially damaged houses. In, in, in the scenario I was, is describing you just now there's only one house there's no there's no other houses and that there this is a, a level of warning that you'll see sometimes from the prophets or, or maybe even sometimes in in tanakh that i mean in even in the torah in the tohaha which is coming up in this next week's parsha that there are there that there's a certain there are certain kinds of lifestyles where if you violate the rules, violate the rules, violate the rules. In the beginning, you may not see any problem or, or maybe there's just a slight consequence to violating the rules. But at one point, there could be something and there's, and there's nothing left. That, that, and that part of the description is that, that, that there could be, you know, for certain people or certain nations, there could be nothing left. That, but you know, coming from violating these uh, these uh, rules, and so like sort of what you're describing with the mother of Sisera, there's like nothing, no problem, no problem, no problem, no problem. But when there's finally a problem, it's done. It's all over. There's nothing left. Anyways. She collapsed. So, yeah. yeah. Or, right. Oh, interesting. All right. I wonder why Shmuel wouldn't like that. We could right. He didn't like. I forgot why he he didn't feel that that was ever a possibility. I don't know why he, he didn't like it. Um, okay. okay. So um, did we do this? I don't know if we did this, but we'll. We'll do it anyways. That is that he commanded us to return all the lands to their owners in this year and that they go out from their buyers without payment. So we're talking about ancestral land. Um, this doesn't apply to um, in, in uh, like uh, houses in the cities, but it does apply to ancestral land um, that they would return to their owners at the time of Yovel and that it's a mitzvah to return it to them without payment. And that is his may be saying, and in all the land of your possession, you shall grant a redemption for the land. He explained to us that this redemption be in this year. And that is his saying in the year of this Jubilee. Now the actual quote from the Pusuk was, uh, so here you have language where the land is being redeemed, is, is getting geula, redemption. I was mentioning the other day that, and this was based on an observation that Lois made when we were studying this in our class, that the, a lot of the language about the return of the land is that the person, the owner is redeemed. In other words, that they, by being once again on their land are no longer in exile. 
you think of oftentimes if the land was sold to somebody else, you think the land is an exile. But in a lot of the descriptions, when, when it's returned, it makes it clear that all this time the person has been in exile because the person hasn't been on their land. So, but here you do have language that the land itself is redeemed. This also allows for an exploration of what is so special about the land of Israel. And is it possible that the land of Israel is special to some degree in its own right, separate from the fact that it is the home of the Jewish people, but that it, it has some qualities that it's possible for land itself to have some qualities that make it important in its own right. Um, that just like the, you know, there could be a special relationship between God and the birds and God and, and plants and God and trees, <clears throat> um, that there could be a kind of special relationship between God and earth. And this idea of land being sacred, again, not just sacred in the sense that it gives us uh, an opportunity to serve God in a particular way, not sacred in the, just in the sense that it allows for us to have a particular service of God, but sacred in its own right. In other words, that it somehow has a unique special connection to God and to godliness, um, irrespective of, of, the, of the Jewish people. So, or irrespective of people. In other words, let's say the land was completely barren of people it might be still said to have some kind of special quality and special relationship with God. Um, yeah. I just thinking, it seems that is the case because God says he'll, he, he will vomit out the people, Yeah, but that's still a connection to people and how they, and how would that, how, how would returning original owners exemplify that, that he has a special relationship? Right. Oh, Somehow, okay. yeah, yeah, I get it. And but it it you see people sort of explore the edges of it. I used to when I was a student in Israel. I remember every once in a while spending Shabbos with people that were very tied to the land. Okay, one second. I, I told my grandson I'll put the pizza in the oven. I'm coming right back one second. Oh yes, put the pizza in the oven. Put the pizza in the oven. Sorry about that. Thank you for your patience. Um, yeah, so um, I don't know why, but when I reflect back on it, there was a particular 
period where I just remember a lot of people saying <laughs> about the land and exploring those edges. I know it's hard to get to a place where there's not something being said that has to do with people, but just because um, there are certainly many people live the, a lot of people in Israel um, who live that way, where they feel like they're living on sacred land and that that land, you know, like the giving tree, that book by Shel Silverstein, well, that kind of a relationship to the land, like the land itself is a party to the relationship and almost like it has its own spirit or soul. And um, yeah, that it, it has meaning and significance all by itself, separate from us. And that part of our relationship with it is as a partner, not just as an object in our service of God. Something like that. Rabbi, how would that be exemplified in the creation story? You know, as a, a particular land, would we say it's almost like the garden? Or well, yeah. So I've wondered about that. When we were studying, remember when we, when we were studying, um, this these sections, the Bahar and then Bahukotai sections. That's where we saw it a lot, and it felt like um, that. For instance, when we go to the land of Israel, there's language that sounds like that language from uh, the creation, from the chapter two, where it talks about la'ovda or the shamra, that he put man in the garden to work it and to guard it. And we saw a similar kind of language uh, um, um, in, in uh, especially the end of Bahar and Bahukotai, we saw that kind of language uh, that suggested that somehow when we're in the land of Israel, we are fulfilling that um, that uh, directive of la'avda ulashamra. There's something about our life there that is um, somehow described in the in that early part of Gan Eden. But it, yeah. Yeah. Wait. Yeah. wait. You know, there is a way to look no. at at the creation story that um, that suggests that we aren't separate from the land. That human beings are are part of the land. That we're an expression of the land. Because we're made of it, and um, you know, when God speak in the beginning of the creating of Shemaim Ba'aret. So there's a way of looking at it that what he's describing is create is creating Shemaim and Aretz. And so you're either Shemaim or you're Aretz. So we would be maybe a combination. We have a little bit that's from Aretz and a little bit that's from Shemaim. But we're one or the other, or, or a combination of the two of them. But it, we're not necessarily a separate entity. We're, we're not a third being. We're not we're not, oh, there's heaven, there's earth, and then there's humans. Mm. Uh, that somehow we are an ex maybe an expression of both, but we are in the very least an expression of the earth. Um, so uh, we, we tend to think of ourselves as separate from the earth, as walking on the earth, um, as impacting the earth as some kind of separate entity, but that in fact, we're not a separate entity. We yeah. are the. So does Hashem get <clears throat> that more specific by choosing from humanity, the Jewish people, and choosing from the earth, Israel land? I'm just wondering. Or it could, it could, yeah. It, it, I mean, it's, I mean, the Ramchal talks about this. Others talk about it. And there's, there are notions that, are mostly, I think, 
derived from Ramosha Chaim Lozato and Der Hashem that have become a popular way of explaining things, but I don't know how we could know ultimately. But the popular way of explaining things is that we are, our purpose is to eventually inspire all of mankind so that it's not supposed to be just um, the Jewish people. Ultimately, it's supposed to be all of mankind. Plus, if you look back at the creation story, in the creation story, before Adam and Eve eat from the tree, it says, Pru urvu umilu esa aretz. It doesn't seem like the goal was to stay in Garden of Eden, or at least that maybe some would stay in the Garden of Eden, but it doesn't seem like that was the goal. The goal was to fill the earth. So ultimately, it was supposed to be the whole earth, not just, and, and it would seem like that should still be the goal, that it's, that, that somehow God's plans include the whole earth, not just the land of Israel. Rabbi Huda Levi in the Kuzari, he has this model of mankind as like, a, like one being, like one person. Uh, so he has like the Greeks being the brain and the Romans would be the arms and he has the Jewish people as the heart. So uh, it seems like there, there are these big picture kind of views. Maybe you would say something like that about the land of Israel, that, that every land has its own special character and quality and, and our, the earth in totality is God's vision, but each part plays a special role, something like that. Okay. All right, yeah. Um, so, and scripture has already been exacting about its commandments and explained that this law would be, what would this law would be like for the seller and the buyer? If the seller wants to redeem his inheritance that was sold before the Jubilee year. And it explained further and said that this law in particular to the lands that are outside of the city wall, I'm sorry, this law is particular to the lands that are outside of the city wall. And that the laws of houses built in the fields is exactly like the law of orchards and gardens, since they are not built within the wall. Uh, these are the houses of the villages about which scripture said it is, it shall be considered as a field of the land. So now the Rambam is giving us a little interesting extra piece of information we wouldn't have been certain about on our own. And that is what is, so there is like city living and there is country living and he is suggesting that small villages are country living and that this land is subject to these laws that what what you would call what you would call um ancestral land so ancestral land is um is uh is going to include villages um which themselves, you might have had a house and you have a small piece of land next to the house and you're planting at that small house, even though you're not terribly far from your neighbor, but those would also, could also be considered part of ancestral land. Um, and the regulations of this commandment have already been explained in Arachin, but it too is only practiced in the land of Israel and at the time when Jubilee is practiced. So again, we saw from the Rambam that when he talks about time when Jubilee is practiced, it, one of the requirements was that each tribe would be on its own land. That's according to the Rambam. Exactly how that would get uh, done in the future is sort of interesting to contemplate. Um, next, 139. That is that he commanded us there be a possibility of redeeming land sold within the city only until the end of the year. So this is a completely different rule. Um, and that is that if you own, let's say you have a condo that's built within a city, a, a walled city, you have a condo. Um, so you are, and you sell it, you have one year to get it back, to buy it back. If you do not buy it back within one year, then um, it, 
uh, you can no longer buy back. I mean, obviously, if you talk to the guy, maybe the guy wants to sell it to you years later, and then you could buy it back. But there is no, he doesn't have a responsibility to sell it to you. If, uh, but but during that year, if you want to buy it back, he must he must sell it back to you. Now, their their Gemara lists several takanot of Hillel, Hillel the elder, um, several decrees. And one of them is a decree about this, because apparently what would happen, according to Hill, they, what they say is what would happen is that the, the seller would, when it came close to a year, let's say the buyer, I'm, I'm sorry, the, 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 the person sold the land. So you have Ruvain who originally owned the condo he sold it to Shimon. Now, the again, the rule is that Ruben has one year to get it back. So let's say you're getting close to the end of the year and Shimon doesn't want to sell it back. So it started to become common for people like Shimon to take off so that there was nobody to buy it back from. And they'd go somewhere far away so they couldn't be reached and the guy wouldn't be able to buy it back. So Hillel's Takana was his 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 decree was that um, you could deposit the money with the court. You didn't actually have to find the guy. You could deposit the money with the court and the court would receive it on his behalf. So even though the guy didn't want you to receive it on his behalf and he's run away, but that was a decree of Hillel so that people would still be able to redeem their property after they sold it. The problem with this decree, and it brings up all sorts of discussions, is how did you still have the Jubilee year in the time of Hillel? If, if according to the Rambam, you require everybody uh, to um, if, that if you require everybody to uh, all the tribes to be in their place, um, certainly that was not the case in the time of Hillel. Hillel lives 50 years before the common era. The uh, tribes were clearly not all in their place. You, you, you didn't even have access to um, all of Israel at, at that time. And certainly you didn't, we didn't even know a lot of the different tribes uh, who they were at that time. They, they certainly weren't all in their place. Uh, if we'll notice here, he do, it's interesting. He doesn't re, he doesn't mention here that that the laws of the jubilee have to apply. But he, he says this has commanded us that there be a possibility of redeeming land sold within the city wall only until the end of the year, and after that year, it remains with the buyer and does not go out in the jubilee year. And that is, it may be exalted as saying, may his name be blessed, saying, and if a man dwells sells a dwelling house in a walled city. The regulations of this commandment have already been explained in Arachim. It is only practice in the land of Israel. Notice he doesn't say it's only practice when the Jubilee is in force, even though he does mention the Jubilee in the beginning. But he, but it's, it's possible, according to the Rambam, that he holds that this law applied even when the Jubilee doesn't apply that you have this right to buy back your property within one year. It's just sort of interesting because it was one of the decrees of Hillel. Why is Hillel decreeing this thing if during the time of Hillel, there wouldn't have been a Jubilee year? Hmm. I thought in the city, Jubilee doesn't apply at all anyway. So this would no, be but just- you, a No, but notice he says, it, it, this, is, it, this is not a law of the Jubilee but you would think it's a law that applies during the Jubilee when the Jubilee was in effect. We have a lot of laws that apply only when the Jubilee is in effect, like certain tithing laws or the Shemitah or certain things may not be biblical if the Jubilee is not in effect. The, the Chawa, taking Chawa, some of these seem to be dependent on whether the Jubilee takes effect. He's distinguishing it from the Jubilee, but... Um, be, be, because during the Jubilee, in other words, in the time where the Jubilee takes effect, you you could buy it back 
way after. And it goes back in the time of the Jubilee. So the, the Torah is saying, whereas all property goes back outside of the, the cities, all the property goes back at the time of the Jubilee. This is not true about city lands. But, the fa but let's say the Jubilee doesn't take effect at all. Would this law take effect? So you're saying it would never cross your mind that the law should take effect, shouldn't take effect because it, it's right. not based on the Jubilee. But by the fact that it contrasts it with the Jubilee, yeah, might, why is might, it might, might, might lead you to believe that it, it's part of a bundle of laws that would only apply when the Jubilee applies. Yes, there. this isn't the exact same law as the Jubilee, but it's a law in the spirit of it. You still get a year to redeem your thing. Why are you getting a year to redeem your land? And I, you could, you could say as as you're suggesting that no, this is completely independent of the jubilee, and I wouldn't even think that it should be um, connected to it, and uh, and that's why he doesn't mention it, and that's possible. Right. Um, okay. Um, all right, we're gonna stop here, and we will continue. I look forward to uh, continuing tomorrow. Thank me, you. Me too. All right. All right. See you all, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.